So my name is Zach Grantham. And I'm Tim Schneider. Yeah, and we are from General Motors. We're super excited to be here today. So uh, I'll start off and let you guys know, spoiler alert, before we start. This, this is sort of a pep talk. Um, we, uh, so, so we all come to these conferences and we hear about all the amazing things that are possible with the technology, all these new cool tools and platforms and all sorts of stuff. Um, this is, this is going to be our success story of a real world problem we actually solved with that technology. Um, it was uh, a big deal, um, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, sort of a, a crisis that, that hit GM that uh, honestly threatened our entire business. Um, and, and with the power of Spring and Pivotal, uh, we were able to tackle it. So that's a spoiler alert going into this. Um, so uh, I'll start off. Um, GM, like, like many companies, uh, probably some of you guys, uh, we, we are in the middle of, of a transformation to be a bit more of a technology company, right? When you guys think General Motors, uh, we're, we're more than 100 years old. We're, we're generally sort of an automotive company with a lot of engineering and manufacturing background. Um, but the world is changing. Our industry is changing, right? We, we have threats to sort of our, our model that we've grown up with. Um, autonomous vehicles, electrification, Electric. connected cars, uh, a, a changing model of car ownership. Uh, and all of these things mean we need to change as well. We really needed to invest in our technology, be able to go faster and, and transform ourselves. So, um, so I wanna focus on two pieces of, of that technology, uh, that journey. So. The first one is in our vehicles uh, today, we have an app store in the infotainment system, right? So, so sort of the screen in the middle there where you can you know, have your radio, uh, looks basically just like this picture. Um, you can actually download apps. Uh, many of them are, are consumer apps um, from our curated app store. So things like a Starbucks app or a Shell app, the weather channel, things like that. Uh, but through this functionality, we can also update some of the uh, core apps in the vehicle, like the actual radio app, uh, if need be. And we do that from time to time. So this is both uh, a function for our consumers, our customers, and for us internally to keep our vehicles up to date. It's pretty core to how our infotainment system works. Uh, additionally, as we look forward, uh, we also allow you to create a profile in the vehicle and save your personal settings to the cloud, right? So if I'm in my Chevy, I can save my radio stations, my seat settings, my climate control, send it off the vehicle to the cloud, right? Both of these functionalities are in vehicle app store and our profiles and personalization go off of the vehicle. And this one in particular is, is pretty critical to us. Um, it seems like just a nice to have, but uh, through our research, we've seen that customers, as they go to buy a new vehicle, generally make a decision on whether or not they want to purchase in about 30 seconds. And they also spend much longer than that adjusting things, trying to get it so you're, you know, it feels right, uh, where you're sitting, things like that. So uh, imagine you can get in a vehicle for a test drive, log in, and it instantly sort of configures to what you like. Additionally, I mentioned the changing model of ownership in our industry, mm. right? Where you may not buy a vehicle in the future, right? You may get into a vehicle that, that you use. Um, so in this case, this becomes, this profile becomes the way we interact with our customers, right? You can save all of your settings and as you go to vehicle to vehicle, it travels with you, right? So this is critical for now, today, but also where we're looking to go as a company. So um, these are really important to us. So I'm gonna rewind back in time about two years. Um, so in the middle of 2017 in China, they passed a new cybersecurity law. And uh, in, in short, this law basically made it so that data that starts in China has to stay in China, right? That's the, the gist of the law. Um, and it has, pretty big penalties for a company like GM. We're actually defined uh, as critical national infrastructure in China. Everyone in the automotive industry is. So if we violate this law, 
Uh, it includes potentially big fines, but more importantly for us, uh, suspension of operation. There, there's a world where if we don't comply with this law, we stop selling vehicles in China. Um, so in, in case you guys don't know, uh, China is the largest automotive market in the world. It is our largest market. Um, every year in profit, we have multiple billions of dollars. Uh, this, this is a threat, this law that was passed sort of overnight, right? It wasn't a planned thing. Uh, it immediately became a crisis for us at GM. Exactly. You might want to add in there that actually globally for sales for GM, 40% of our global sales comes from China itself. So we're talking a huge number of vehicles and a huge investment here. That's right. Yep. And so uh, at the time, the functionality I'd mentioned earlier for our app store and our profiles and personalization, uh, they existed in our vehicles in China and they were provided by, at the time, a third party vendor. And it was using their proprietary tools and, and languages and actually hosted in their data centers uh, all around the world. And you can see where the stars are and there's none in China, right? And, and they had no plans to put any in China. So basically with this law being passed overnight, uh, we had a ticking clock till our vehicles became illegal, uh, which as we said, would, would basically uh, put us uh, potentially out of business even. I mean, any, any company where you said overnight, half of your, your revenue goes away, that's a pretty big deal. So uh, as we mentioned, we, we were uh, a company in the middle of a transformation with our technology. And we sat down and we looked at how do we solve this problem? So uh, a, couple, a couple goals that we set out. First, obviously, we needed to comply with this new law. Right, that's, that's the, the stakes to be in the game. We, we have to, have to, have to um, meet this date, at the end of the year. So it was about 12 months or so. Um, and uh, we had to basically do it there in China. But uh, the system we had in place, it had been in active development for over three years. Um, it was a pretty large system. And so even, even meeting this uh, was a bit of a goal here. It uh, wasn't necessarily easy. But the first thought, uh, as, as generally many of us as developers go, okay, how can I make this uh, shorter, right? What can I cut out and do and kind of just get to the finish line? But importantly for us, this is vehicle technology, right? It's in vehicles. And generally our rule of thumb is anything in, that's in the vehicle, we're gonna need to support for 20 years or more, right? So although we had this short, short runway where we had to do this, uh, these changes to be in China and meet the law, we didn't actually want to make it something that was so short and so quick that we'd, we'd hate it for the next 19 <laughs> years of the 20 years, right? So we needed to do it in a way that created a platform for long-term success, right? So um, we had short-term goals, but also long-term goals. And when we sat down, uh, all of us as, as a team, we really identified two key challenges to meeting both of these. So the first one is that we needed to perform our vehicle testing process. So a little bit of this is, is some project management, right? We looked at our, our due date at the end of 2018 and we worked our way backwards four to six months. And vehicle testing for us, um, oftentimes in the software world, right, we think of uh, automated testing and unit testing and performance testing. Um, when, when we're talking about vehicles, it, it goes a step further where we actually test in real vehicles. We have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, raise your hand, how many of you guys have ever heard, we couldn't do software testing today because it was raining, right? Um, we have people who are actually out in the cars actually testing all new functionality just to make sure it's safe, right? Safety is our, is our first mm -hmm. priority and we don't mess around with that. So um, our vehicle testing process actually does take that long because it does rain some days, right? Um, Sometimes you, you sit in one spot all day testing and the vehicle's battery dies, things like that. So uh, this is a very real, very manual process to make sure everyone is safe. And so we needed to work that into the schedule. But that meant our development timeline that we said, uh, the previous application had been three years of active development and we need to replace it. It just shrunk even more, right? We carved out half the time and we basically said, 
we have about four months of development time. Uh, the second challenge uh, that, that Tim will tackle quite a bit more is obviously we showed earlier, we had no existing infrastructure in China. Um, the, the key mandate of the law we were looking at was it has to be in China. And so when we started out, we had nothing there. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk a bit about how we address both of those challenges. And it turns out it ended up being much of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of our journey at GM in, in terms of trying to become more technology first uh, was to adopt PCF, Pivotal Platform, and really get everyone to use it. And we had some early adopters, um, like, like Tim and I, mm -hmm. uh, of the technology. And we had a few projects using it here and there, but we hadn't really built uh, critical momentum to actually get all of our developers to use it. And, and maybe more importantly, our leaders to actually buy in on this solution, right? We, we had gone to our IT leadership and said, hey, let's spend a bunch of money and spin up this cloud. And you know, we start using terms like, it'll be more scalable and reliable and you know, they're, it doesn't quite have the impact um, that, that it does probably on most of the people here in this room. Mm -hmm. So, And most of the apps that we had when we first launched were relatively small yeah. apps, testers, starters, just moving into it, nothing really that you could say is absolutely critical to our company. This would have been the first. Yeah, so, so we got together and we said, let's go all in on putting this on PCF, on Pivotal Platform, and using all of the spring tools to, to meet these goals and challenges, right? And that was a big step for us uh, as a company, right? To, to say something that is so critical to our company as a whole, our, our, it's, it's sort of an, uh, a threat to our existence potentially, we're gonna go all in on this technology to solve it for us, was a big step uh, for us to take. It was sort of a leap of faith and then uh, you know, it fell a little bit on us to, uh, to make it come true. So um, the first challenge we talked about is, is our vehicle testing. And um, I won't get too much into the actual testing, but the most important part is, is, again, it shrunk our timeline to only four months to do our development, kind of from beginning to end. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're all here at the Spring One Conference 2019. Um, in late 2017, when we started this, we basically went and looked at every single breakout session uh, from the 2017 conference, took all of the buzzwords and said, yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, you know, if you, if you went back two years, this would be every session was uh, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and, you know, a lot of microservices. Um, and so we, we looked at what was there and we, like I said, we went, we went all in. So we, we started with, um, a microservices approach, right? Sort of a domain-driven design. We spent some time planning and looking at and how we approach uh, breaking up our work. And then as we started to develop it, we, we had actually a, a lot of uh, college uh, hires, sort of brand new college hires. This was a lot of their first experiences. And so a lot of the tools um, were, were easy for them to grasp, right? You can work with Spring Boot really quickly to spin up a service. Right? Uh, Spring Cloud allows you to have a circuit breaker very, very quickly and easily. Right? You can use Hystrix for that. Um, you can use the service registry. Very, very simple. Um, let's see, what else do we use? We, we use Sleuth and Zipkin for distributed tracing. And like I said, every buzzword from, from two years ago, we, we put in here. Um, and so that gave us kind of the, the foundation in our code to very efficiently just start working on our actual domain problem, right? We didn't have to spend a lot of time setting up these microservices, um, looking at boilerplate code. We could very quickly spin up some templates um, and get going on the actual real business problems we were trying to tackle, not just the kind of piecing together technology. Um, but that software on its own wouldn't have done anything without Pivotal Platform and the Pivotal Marketplace underneath, right? So I mentioned we, we had uh, the concept of a service registry to connect all of our microservices. Well, that took 30 seconds to set up with the Pivotal Marketplace in Pivotal Platform. 
Um, we use RabbitMQ, right? Again, it's 30 seconds to set up and bind our services. So uh, by combining sort of the Spring software uh, library choices with the, the Pivotal platform as our platform, we were able to marry that and just, again, start moving forward as quickly as possible. And the last point uh, for delivery here is uh, we, we relied pretty heavily on some of the things we had already, uh, Bitbucket and Artifactory. We were able to bring them together with, with Concourse to uh, deploy these to a number of servers. Again, do a lot of the uh, automated testing ahead of time that we wanted to do. And uh, ultimately for us, um, just try things out much more rapidly, right? Really, really be able to innovate here. And, and I mentioned um, kind of uh, as we started, we did have a little bit of a planning cycle that allowed us to kind of figure out how we can uh, do a lot of this work in parallel, right? Really focus again on, on the domain aspects of it, the real GM related work we had to tackle. And so you can kind of see on the left some of the, the uh, domains we, we carved out um, from things like a, a vehicle, right? We have you know, data about our vehicle. We have uh, different data about its capabilities and our app store and all these different domains that we're able to early on create uh, the APIs that we would need between them or the objects we pass back and forth because much of this is event driven um, and kind of stub out how they would all communicate with each other. And then we got started working and they all went at various rates of speed, right? We, we this project as we worked on it, um, I know kind of uh, in, in my career, um, you know, we talk sometimes about waterfall approaches and uh, everybody goes, ooh. And, and, and uh, I, I love to work in an agile uh, environment, right? Where you can really iterate and kind of uh, go fast that way. Um, and sometimes, you know, we have the uh, sort of derogatory term of agile fall. Um, if you guys have heard of that, um, a little bit where you kind of just mix them together and you usually get the worst of both worlds. Um, but sometimes, uh, even in an agile world, right, for this, um, we knew exactly what we needed to accomplish by, by the certain date, right? And so it actually helped us a little bit to go back to some of our waterfall routes and do a little bit of planning here. Um, upfront kind of waterfall, here's, here's what it's all gonna look like kind of connected together. And, and then from there, again, using still the really new, cool, modern tools, uh, we, we could paralyze everything and ultimately uh, get where we needed to go after four months, um, which turned us then to uh, ultimately the much larger problem of we, we had done all of this on our development internal cloud in North America and uh, we needed to get it to China. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tim, who's going to uh, kind of walk you through that. Thanks. But just to build on what you were saying, we did need to get it over there, but quite honestly, the, one of the bigger challenges was, once it was there, where was it gonna run? So, oh, wrong way. Like I said, what we, did, what we ended up doing was working with our uh, joint venture partner that's uh, SAIC, for those of you who don't know, in order to do business and to sell vehicles inside of China, you actually have to be part of a joint venture where the Chinese side of it owns 51%. So. Yeah, so for that, it basically means, as we talk about uh, taking this to production, it's taking it to production at another company, um, like truly another company, although we kind of own half of them. We're, we're two separate companies trying to accomplish different things, uh, directly 12 hours apart, um, so uh, it's, it's tricky dealing with all of that. Right. It, just uh, to reiterate what Zach had mentioned earlier about the timelines, as you see, the development started way earlier than what we actually had for vehicle testing and install and training on the bottom parts of it. So, as you said, we had to go into the North American cloud. We had to develop there. We had to test there validate that everything worked and then we were able to use the concourse pipelines to then deploy to the newly set up application or new, newly set up platform in china yeah and, and go back real quick tim the as, as we initially planned this you can see sort of the the red section uh in july and august 
we, we recognize that as our sort of danger zone. Um, you can see that we have this install box that doesn't finish until mid-August, but at the very bottom, vehicle testing starts in July. So um, that was, that was our, our danger area, our challenge, is how do we start vehicle testing on time without an environment in China? Um, and that's, again, where, where Pivotal Platform helped save mm -hmm. the day for us. One of the other things to note out there, after the install, we obviously talked about training. You have to remember, once we set this up 12 hours on the other side of the planet, we needed staff on the ground with hands-on that could actually maintain and operate this system for us. Otherwise, we're going to be getting calls all hours of the day and night. So part of the, part of the plan that we had was to go in and do a lot of knowledge transfer to, to our JV partner so that they could actually maintain the system itself. So as we talked about before, you know, initial, our, our first step on there was the testing environment in North America. Then we migrated all the code and the data over to SAIC and then had the testing environment and the in-vehicle car testing happened in-country. Yeah, and from, from the development team side, right, the sort of as a 12 factors application, one of the, one of the factors is you want to have dev prod parity, right? Where, wherever you're doing your development, you want your production environment to look the same, not any surprises. And so again, that was kind of our challenge here, and, and Pivotal Platform helped us with that. From the application perspective, it looked exactly the same when we used our North America install uh, versus the later install in China. So we're able here in sort of step one as a development team to test against our, our North America GM internal Pivotal Platform, and then later, once it was ready in China, immediately switched testing there with no delay, right? There wasn't any downtime. It was one day we're in North America, next day we're in China. Everything works seamlessly because uh, everything was sort of abstracted away by the Pivotal platform. So from a uh, development team perspective, it was the same. Great. So as we talked about earlier, the deployment strategy was kind of a three-step process. The first one, obviously, was the hardware acquisition. We used our joint venture partner and their hosting environment. They procured all of the hardware that we needed, setting up uh, three availability zones over there. So we jointly created the bill of materials, and our JV partner actually set up all the hardware there. What happened after the hardware, obviously, got on and the infrastructure portions of it, uh, our U.S. engineers and the in-country, in-China engineers on that side basically did a joint uh, platform install, and they did it remotely, and again, it's a 12 hours, it's a 12 hour change, so obviously there were some people working very early in the morning and some people working very early at n or very late at night, but it actually went very well because we were able to stand up the platforms. We have a pair of platforms there for failover. That way they're stitched together using a GTM. That way, if we need to do disruptive maintenance on one of them, the other one is up and running at all times. Uh, we also created an additional tooling cluster. That way we could deploy other things too there. Uh, Dynatrace, uh, Elk, other associated pieces for the ecosystem that it would be used on. And then finally, as we talked about a couple seconds, as I mentioned a couple seconds ago, we did an on-site uh, training and transfer. We took some of our US-based engineers, put them on a plane, took them over to China. They sat down with the group for two weeks and did an entire knowledge, knowledge transfer, rudimentary debugging, how to apply upgrades, all the rest of that. And it resulted in some fully trained staff that's over there that are actually really good now. They've helped us on a few problems as well. So end result, just to summarize a lot of what we've been saying, we ended up getting a local China environment. It came in on time. It was fully tested. We had a redundant and scalable thing with trained on-site support and ended up making the regulatory uh, timeline that we had to make in order to continue selling vehicles. Yeah, and, and so this, this ended up as a, as a big win for, for not only sort of our, our, our project team and our, and our cloud services team, but kind of all of, of GM. Um, we, we obviously <laughs> didn't, didn't have to stop selling cars in China, which is big. Uh, Tim and I stayed employed, <laughs> which is big for us. Um, but, but beyond that, it really kind of showed in a lot of ways our, our senior leadership 
what's possible um, kind of, you know, it, it before where we were kind of, we were using a little bit of nerd talk when we talked to them. Now it's very <laughs> easy to say, look, you had a huge problem and we came in and basically did the impossible in solving it by picking the right tools and technologies and going all in on it. And, and that really was something that they could touch. It really resonated with them. And so that was one of the, one of the pieces, along with some other projects at the time that really started kind of our GM snowball towards uh, more cloud native development. Um, you know, now the big buzzword is Kubernetes, uh, which, <laughs> which Tim is responsible for. So uh, two years from now, we'll, we'll be talking about that, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll be back um, next year talking about it. But uh, yeah, and, and it continues even with, you know, the, the one particular app we've talked about. So um, yeah. next slide real quick. Actually, oh. one of the things I wanted yeah. to add on to yours was there was a discussion early on of, do we play this safe? Yeah. I mean, this is a big thing. This is a big thing for us. Do we d deploy on traditional VMs using a model that we had before? And the looks at it was, well, we could, or we could actually do it faster and make sure that we've got it there. It would have been holy hell to do this in a traditional manner. And eh, yeah, all of you are sitting there nodding, going, "Yeah, that would suck." Yeah, it would have. And uh, and like I said, th th this store started our snowball. So. Um, I, in the next slide, I have the numbers for this particular app, right? Just the App Store and personalization. It's one of our hundreds of apps mm -hmm. now, at least. Um, but I mentioned we, we started in China, and that, that was late last year. And since then, we, we've gone to f uh, three other regions, right? We're in four different regions around the world. And in each of those regions, sometimes up to 20 different PCF Pivotal Platform spaces, uh, where we have... 19 different microservices as part of this application. And each of them obviously has a number of app instances. So with just this one product itself, we have 3000 total app instances around the world. Um, and as Tim said, with, with traditional VMs or, or sort of a different approach, we would be, this would be impossible to achieve this scale. In, in this time frame to maintain it and everything else, but um, not to mention the cost. Yeah. So, so again, uh, for us, um, this project is an example of how, uh, by by leaning all in on Spring and Pivotal, uh, we were able to sort of meet our, our critical time of need, but also set us up for the future. Right. It, it wasn't just a short term fix. This really made it so that we could uh, be successful long term as we go forward as well. Cool. So. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's us. Where I'm Zach. That's Tim. Um, we have uh, tomorrow morning, actually, on the main stage, um, our good friend uh, from GM, Niall Sheehan, is going to be one of the speakers, and he's actually going to talk quite a bit more about, uh, as you can see there, our journey to zero touch experience for developers. So this this today we talked about one project within kind of our wider transformation. So Niall's going to go a bit more in depth on uh, how we set up sort of the ecosystem and environment for all of our developers and all of IT to be successful uh, with, with as little hands-on uh, need as possible. So we'd love you guys to check that out if you can. Um, otherwise, we want to open up for any questions you guys yeah. have. And, uh, yeah? Did the GDPR also have a big impact on business? Uh, so did GDPR also have a big impact on business? Uh, the answer is it would have, but we actually, uh, as GM, uh, sold our European business. So uh, it has not had a big impact. But um, the, the idea behind GDPR um, resonates in lots of countries, right? As, as we look around the world, um, kind of uh, Korea, Brazil, Australia, um, even parts of the, of the U.S., right? There's like Massachusetts and California. Everyone's considering pieces of legislation very similar to that, where we'll need to have data hosted um, on location. Um, and so that's uh, that's something that that sort of a, a microservice architecture uh, really helps us with. And again, you know, it's pretty pretty easy to sort of spin up um, pivotal platform somewhere if we need to. And again, it's it's all the same everywhere. We don't really have to worry about uh, it being different. So it's pretty easy to move. Again, with this application, we, we've actually deployed it. Uh, it's in Europe now. Um, for We do have some legacy customers, like I said, that we will support for the next uh, 20 plus years. So it's pretty easy to, uh, to comply with those laws. 
Any other questions? Yes. Congratulations for getting the job well done. Oh. Thank, Thank you. you. So in terms of if you could walk me through or walk us, all of us through, like your journey in terms of the microservices, getting on that, four, four months is a pretty short uh, time. Like I said, I could fully see that. So what's your experience in that? And then I have three questions. So first one is that. Second one is, why did you decide to go with the cloud foundry versus a public cloud? And third one is, how do you roll out the updates all across the world? Okay. Yep. So, uh, first question was uh, how did how do we approach our microservices? Kind of just a general on that. Uh, second question is why we didn't use a public cloud. And third question: how do we uh, how do we handle how updates? Do we updates. Yeah. So um, the the public cloud answer is pretty easy. Um, obviously, uh, security is pretty important to a lot of this. Um, so we have it as part of our internal cloud, and there's a whole bunch of security layers it goes through, um, which we can't mm -hmm. obviously get too in-depth about, but um, there's a number of, of reasons uh, that, that we host those types of things internally um, versus putting them out in the uh, public cloud. And it's also a financial thing. We've made huge investments into our internal infrastructure, both hardware, software, and data centers. We have two state-of-the-art data centers that would blow your mind. They're really nice. Yeah, so from a business perspective, it's kind of, well, we can't we do it ourselves. Can run it we can run it cheaper in using our internal staff than we could at of AWS. Yeah, so then in terms of how did how do we end up with the microservices and how do we approach it? Um, uh, honest question, right? We, we set out with a domain-driven design. We kind of knew, right, what we needed to accomplish and uh, we, we screwed it up a couple of times. We, we said, here's how we should slice up this problem. And, and then we all looked at it and said, oh, that's terrible. That's not going to work, right? So, um, you know, if any of you guys have tried to do domain-driven design, it, it's pretty tough uh, to, to sort of get it right. Um, as in, as in uh, sort of anti-pattern, we actually, the first time we ended up with the Death Star, where you sort of have every microservice calling another microservice um, and, uh, you know, to do anything, there's 17 different requests. Um, and so again, part of this is, you know, you, you learn as you go. Um, but for, for us, um, the biggest thing was trying to, to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and uh, so you see, like when we show the, them there, you know, we have things that are like the, the account service, right? It just, it, it's, uh, it doesn't do a lot individually, um, and it's about how we string things together, and we really tried to, to keep all those simple so we could go fast, and then figure out where we can break them apart to not uh, depend on each other, right? So we could be really um, asynchronous. And so a lot of this is, is sort of um, an event-driven architecture. So as a quick example, right, if we need to um, notify a vehicle that we have like a, a critical security update for an app, Right, that, that's an asynchronous process, and so we break that apart, and we kind of, uh, a little bit of domain-driven design and knowing what, what you know, our actual uh, needs are, we are able to kind of come up with that. But like anything, it was a bit of trial and error too. And third thing, how do we update uh, around the world is, uh, it's tricky. Um, so obviously it's vehicle-facing functionality, there's cars on the road 24-7 everywhere in the world. So everything we do is sort of a blue-green deployment, right? It has to be up all the time, um, no excuses for bringing it down. And that's our main driving factor um, in terms of how we do updates. Uh, beyond that, Pivotal Platform makes it all easy, right? You can kind of, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've done them in the middle of the day sometimes, um, yep. you know, with, with very low risk, right? It's, uh, and so most of it is, is coordinating how do we get the code to the right regions and, and that type of uh, activities um, when we need to do updates. And just to build on what he said, that, that would cover the application yeah. portions of it. The actual platform, we have two of them, as we mentioned before, and they're stitched together with a GTM. So when we need to do maintenance or upgrades, we'll do it on the passive side, have the applications check out, yep, you're all still good. Well, then the passive then becomes active, and then the newly passive side it gets patched right after that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and from the, from a, the app perspective, right, it, with the, the GTM load balancer in front of it, there's, again, no downtime. It's just sort of, we can seamlessly flip back and forth between our PCF foundations, which um, we generally try to have not at the same location either, right? If they got 
hit by lightning or, you know, whatever, flood. Their tech, oh, never seen a flood. No, nope, it hasn't happened. We've actually, um, actually in China, there is one physical data center, but there's two separate rooms. So there's yeah. diversity in that, in that regards between those two foundations. The long-term plan is to actually, they're acquiring another, another physical site and the hardware will be moved over to that new physical site. Yep. All right, any other questions? Yeah, way in the back there. Uh, how many platform team or uh, SRD, SRD team is working on the uh, 3000 AI environment? Uh, how big is the development team working on that? Yeah. Um, about, uh, about 10 people. 10 people. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, again, that's sort of the, the beauty of it is you can do more with less. Like uh, the, the previous um, version of this application, you know, the team was three, four times as large and took three to four times as long to do stuff as well. Um, by, by especially Spring Cloud uh, tied together with Pivotal platform, like half of your work is done already. It just kind of auto wires and all connects. So you're really just focusing on our, our business problems, our business domain. So nowadays, if, if we need to go in and do something, it is true value add innovation. It's not messing around with, you know, how we get these things to talk to each other or configure or any of that. It, it's really all pure, purely adding value. So um, it doesn't take a large development team to build these things. And it doesn't take a large team to maintain it either. Yeah. Um, Tim can talk a bit about uh, some of the metrics underneath, um, but uh, we have Dynatrace and a lot of other metrics to make sure the platform is up at all times. And then the platform itself makes sure our app is healthy at, at all times. So, um, you know, we, it has auto scaling and if an instance goes down, uh, Pivotal Platform detects that and starts another copy, right? So, um, which for us, at, you know, just again, our industry is one of the big concerns is, is our scalability. Um, you know, it used to be years ago, uh, an event like the Super Bowl, where we'd have a big commercial, it would be all hands on deck. And like for a week in front of that, nobody on any team was allowed to deploy anything. It was, you know, this is, we need to be ready for this moment. And, and nowadays we're like, what? Well, what? and a lot of yeah. times, a lot of times during Super Bowl ads, we increase the number of servers. So you incre increase capacity on that. And on a legacy side, that's not an easy thing, and it's not a cheap thing, and it's a pain in the butt to stand up, and then when you're done with it, you have to tear it all right back down. Yep, so again there, that's, that's how we shave people off, where we don't need it, right? Right there is, we used to have a war room on Super Bowl night, where people could be ready for this, and now the auto scaler just shoop, scales up when we need it, and then back down afterwards, and you don't need people for it. It happens faster than people could even do it, so. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and the commercials. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Any other questions you guys have? All right, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, and uh, have a great day. Thank you all.